This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. Metron Garage is a company designing unique garages, condos, and other structures specifically for the auto enthusiasts. They've got eight models to choose from, including two-story options, which I think is super cool, while with a very modern look and feel to them. And they come in all sizes, and they're fully customizable. You can check out them today and start specking your own ultimate garage at metrongarage.com, where you can request a catalog or talk to someone to learn more. So be sure to check it out. Hey, welcome to the 200th episode of Recreating a Classic with Devin Motorsports. I thought I'd give you a quick overview as to how I got into podcasting about collector cars. Now, a few of you have asked, and I thought this would be an appropriate time to cover this. So a few years ago, I was doing an educational podcast for kids called Learn From Others. And basically, I wanted to interview career professionals so that kids could learn from them. You know, what were their mistakes? What were their successes? What advice would they give to them? And I always had a cool little car thing at the end that I would do, basically pairing you know, them with what I think would be a cool classic car based on their profession. And one of my guests, John Corcoran, he was a political speech writer for President Bill Clinton and Governor Gray Davis. When we were off air, not recording, we started talking about cars and he asked me, you know, if someone were to describe you in one or two words, what would it be or how would they describe you? And I said, well, I'm the car guy. And he said, you should probably do a podcast about cars. So sure enough, I started up the podcast. Initially, I called it Auto Sausage, which I thought was fun and witty and it allowed me to do some cartoon stuff with like a Wienermobile that I thought was fun. My wife loved it. But as I started trying to promote it, it didn't quite come across as a podcast about cars. And I thought, you know what, let me be as straightforward and direct as I possibly can, hence the Collector Car Podcast. Now, you know, I decided, you know what, what insight would I have that the average person doesn't have? And that's where I took my 25 years of analytical insight experience from the consumer product goods industry. And I thought, you know what, let me apply that to the collector car market. So that was kind of the reason I work on, you know, different market trends for cars. And I will do more of that going forward. I just have a lot of fun stuff I want to talk about and cool people to talk with. So Stay tuned for some more market trends coming up soon, and I'm looking forward to you joining me for my next 200 episodes. One of my mentors is Mark Green from Cars Yeah, and if you know him and his podcast, he hits the 200 episode mile mark like every other week, just because he uh, he does one a day, basically. He's, he's crazy. He does a wonderful job. So for today's episode, we are going to learn more about recreating classic Devons with Kevin Callahan. Now, we'll get to this in one second, but be sure to stay tuned to after the interview, and I will review the differences between continuation cars, replica cars, clones, kit cars, along with a recap of what continuation cars are available today from the original manufacturer. Now, there are a lot more out there than I thought there were. There are some brands I didn't realize they were making continuation cars, which is pretty cool. So now I will also do my best to capture all of the different AC Cobra options out there and rank them by value. Now this is a huge task as the AC Cobra is the most replicated car in history, replicated by the factory as well as a lot of different makers. So now let's learn a little bit more about Kevin and the Devons he's recreating. Today I have Kevin Callahan with Devon Sports Cars. Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Yeah, no problem. I, I know you're dealing with some really cool cars. Uh, for those of you who are not around in the 50s and 60s <laughs> and maybe are not as car crazy as I am, you might not know what a Devon is. Uh, they're really cool fiberglass cars, and I, I'm going to leave it to the expert to tell us a little bit more. So, Kevin, I don't need you to you know give us every model, every generation but if you could, kind of give our listeners an overview of Devon, and more specifically, what you're doing to resurrect the brand. Yeah, so um, people are just picking up, starting to listen. They might want to Google uh, Devon Sports Car, and, and you'll see a very Ferrari-looking car, like a Tessarosa 250 or maybe a Maserati 300. 
So it had a very Italian European look to it. And this is back in say the mid fifties. So the cars Devin made, you mentioned are fiberglass and they had this um, very Italian influenced body on it. And what people were doing back in the days, they at first they could actually buy this lightweight fiberglass body and put it on a car that they were building or a car maybe they got it off in a racetrack and crashed. So then they would put this lightweight body on and go racing with a very stylish looking car. Bill Devin went on from there and he made four different cars, which we'll talk about in more depth as we go through the podcast. And what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to re re-wreck the brand. Right now we're making parts and pieces for cars who um, people have cars and maybe gotten an accident or maybe they bought this body but never finished the car. Their father bought it, maybe never finished it, and they want to do that now. And we've gone even one step further where we're starting to make bodies and uh, we hopefully make rolling chassis here soon. So that's what we're doing over here at Devon Sports Cars. Yeah, yeah. So if you would kind of talk on each of those different models, you know, generally – and what was the typical power plant? It sounds like, you know, there were probably a couple different options available, uh, especially if you're building it your own. But was there one power plant per model that was more common than another? We'll go through them from the beginning. The, the first sports car that Bill Devin made back in 53 was a Panhard. And this had a very small 1,500cc, almost motorcycle-type motor in it. And he made these cars um for about two years, and in fact, in 1956, he won a national championship, or another driver won a national championship with that that sports car, and that he led his tag, his branding name, as he's been manufacturing championship sports cars since 1956, and that was the first year he actually made a car, and it, it did very well, obviously, win the national championship. Sure. From there, he went on to build what was called the Devon SS, and this is probably referred to as one of his flagship cars. Um, it was 92-inch wheelbase. It was very Ferrari Testarossa looking, and it was uh, powered by a Chevy 283. Following that, he made what was called the Devon D. Devon D was a rear engine, um, had a Porsche or a VW engine in it. Following the Devon D, he made a Devon C, which had a Corvair motor into it, and his final car they probably produced and never went into production and made two for the New York Auto Show in 1964 was a Devon GT and this was a hard top and it also had a Corvair motor in it so those are the products and models as we run through the timeline yeah sure now that's pretty interesting because you know anytime you hear Corvette V8 that's a potent car especially for the era is there one particular model that you gravitate towards versus another? Still doing my proof of concept with the um, customer base out there. And uh, interesting, I thought the Devon SS would be the flagship. Everybody would gravitate towards that. But there's an amazing following to what we call the Devon D. And the Devon D had a Porsche 4, you know, two, a 356 motor in it. Very lightweight, Porsche suspension on it. Um, and its body looked very much like a Speedster. And a lot of vintage racers go out there and have a lot of success in this because it's basically a Porsche with a lightweight body on it. So I was surprised to answer your question. The Devon D has a lot of following, but I bet you the SS in the long run, proof of concept will show that would be the most desirable of all of them. It's very interesting that you mentioned the Devon D and the Porsche powertrain in the rear there because one thing I've noticed, and I've covered them on this podcast a few times, uh, Porsche in period made a handful, I think it was nine Zagato bodied Porsches. And to me, that's what the Devlin D looks like. And one of them was recently at Amelia Allen Concord d'Elegance. And we, RM Sotheby's recently sold one uh, at Amelia as well. It was white with uh, red stripes on the rear, rear fenders, uh, pontoon, kind of pontoon kind of fenders. But mm-hmm. I'm amazed at how much it looks like the Devlin D. So I don't know. As you resurrect the brain, you might want to look at two different versions. (laughs) They're cool cars, that's for sure. They really are. When uh, somebody takes that Devon D and they paint it in silver and and put a red stripe on it or something, um, even they put the Porsche grates on the back for ventilation. It's uh, very... What is it, the dirty bastard looking, you know, speedster looking car? Yeah, yeah. And I know you mentioned on the pre-call and you referenced it here is, you know, you're, you're... bringing back, you're resurrecting the brand. And we had talked a little bit about, you know, there's a, a trend going on with continuation cars now. Exactly what do you call these cars that are, you know, period, they drive like period, you know, they have the engines of the period, they're, you know, everything for the most part back to the 1950s or 1960s. So 
How does this process process work for you? You said you're doing proof of concept right now. Does that mean you'll take, you know, whatever direction you think you want to go in, whether it's the SS or the D or the C? And do you have a supply of Devon chassis? Are you using a new chassis? Like, walk us through the process. I thought I almost go back and tell you a little bit how I got into this position. Um, I had bought a Devon body, and I started communicating with people out in California, uh, made some friends. And one day I get a call, and the guy tells me that the Devon uh, sports car company could be up for sale. So following it back, Bill Devon did kind of retire from this business in 64, but he kept on making parts and pieces for uh, customers. He kept his molds. He kept his patterns. He kept all of his jigs. And he had all that up until he died in 2000. Upon his death in 2000, there's a couple of gentlemen out in California, and should never be underestimated what these guys did, but like Richard Julius and Steve Young and Dr. Bricker, they went out and contacted Bill Devon's widow and actually bought all this stuff, put it in containers and kept it out in California until 2019 when I came along and made an agreement and uh, flew out there and bought all this stuff. So for me to make a continuation car, I am using parts and pieces that were originally in Bill Devon's inventory. I'm using the original patterns I'm going down to the Amish, and they're taking them and putting these wood patterns into sand and making me cast aluminum parts. Uh, we have the original jig table for the frame. So this vehicle we'll be putting together will definitely have the heart and soul and the DNA of Bill Devon's race car. It's not just being made off of drawings or pictures of coffee table books. These, these are the real parts and pieces we're manufacturing. Wow, okay. So will you be manufacturing the chassis as well? Looking into that now, and we're trying to build the first one right now and, and sort it all the way through, but it's something we're definitely looking to do. Give you some customer a rolling chassis and a body on it. Right, yeah. For my listeners, if you're not aware, some of the large companies, large automakers such as Aston Martin and Jaguar, they're recommissioning continuation cars. So, in, for example, like the XKSS, there were so many left over in the factory when the factory burnt down of the chassis, so they're taking those original VIN numbers and they're building the cars back to original specification with hand-formed aluminum, with the rivets, everything back to the way it was. And uh, it's interesting to see how the collector car audience embraces these. I mean, they've actually recently sold for what they originally sold for. So if it sold for a million dollars, you know, when it came back on the market, it sold for that ballpark, maybe even a little bit more. So... A lot of folks are really liking these recreations. Even though they're still expensive, they're not as, as as expensive as the originals would be, such as a lightweight alloy Jaguar, one of those types of cars. Obviously, the Devon's a lower price point, and it seems like it would be much more uh, attainable and achievable for the average enthusiast, correct? Correct, yeah, much more. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, that's really great. Now, which car mm-hmm. is your favorite to drive? I mean, you talk about a front-engine Corvette V8 versus a rear-engine <laughs> Porsche, uh, you know, tremendously different driving dynamics in the two different models. Do you have a preference, like, as far as uh, which one's your favorite? Even though I don't own one, I would say the Devon D is probably the most fun to drive um, because of its light weight and just, uh, just, just a, it's a big go-kart and it just goes. Um, The SS is probably my favorite one to look at um, and probably very close to drivability too. It's really nice. Um, longer body, just the lines and proportions look just really right to me. So to answer your question, probably the best driver would be the Devon D. If I want to have a ham sandwich and sit in my shop and look at one, it's going to be a Devon SS. (laughs) That's great. Well, what's the path going forward? How can our listeners get involved if they want to grab one of these you know, resurrected classics, you know, and put it on the road themselves. Right now we're building two test and development uh, vehicles, and one hopefully is going to be running at Goodwood um, in the fall. Um, We actually have two original frames left over from Malcolm McGregor and Nolan Hillis. They were the two uh, Irish gentlemen who built the frames that Bill Devon used back in 1957. And, and that's how he had such a sophisticated race car. He had the European technology with independent four-wheel suspension, disc brakes all around, inboard disc brakes on the rear, a Dion tube. He had a very sophisticated chassis in, say, 1957 to 1959 and thereon to run this car. So based on these test and development vehicles, we're going to be looking for channel partners to start 
hopefully building some of these. And they're going to go at it with eyes wide open. Yeah, there are things that we're still sorting out. Something as simple as the door jams in 1957 tolerances are different than what somebody wants to see today. In other words, they could be bigger back then. It wasn't as important to have them really tight as it is today when you're building a quarter million dollar car. So we're still sorting out a little of these things. So we're going to look for channel partners to, to go in with us at the beginning with eyes wide open. We're not going to have all the answers, but we're going to work with them on the build and, and see it from start to finish. Okay. No, that sounds great. And what's the best way for our listeners to learn more and to view these beautiful cars on your website? My website, you can find us at um, Devon Sports Cars, LLC. Um, that's also our Instagram uh, handle. And, um, we're on Facebook also. Uh, we're getting out a newsletter, so reach out to us one of those um, formats, and we'll make sure we'll put your list on, a uh, name on the list, so uh, you'll get a copy of our newsletter. And Instagram, we keep on putting up pictures and show us, uh, show customers how we're going to be building these test and development vehicles step by step. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. You can almost be part of the process if you sign up and kind of get the updates to see how things are going and. Uh, really enjoy the process as you take it from from concept to fruition to actually have a running driving car that people can check out in person right yeah and more than just that a car that you could put on the track and run um, this car is going to be a lot of go and also show but we're going to do it right and make sure that it is can hang out and and hold up to a vintage race without any um, problems so we're Staying with the DNA, Bill Devin. He started as a race car driver. He built race cars, and we want to continue to do that. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, one thing I like to do at the end of these podcasts is to play a little game. I believe I gave oh, you a heads up go. on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Keep I Cash. I your podcast. I hate this. <laughs> you hate it, but it's fun. <laughs> yep. If you can't, if you can't put put a car in the crusher, just give me like number one, two, three, then I'll throw it in the crusher for you. All right. <laughs> so I'll give you three cars. You have to pick one to keep forever, one to cash in, and then unfortunately one to send to the crusher. So I decided to go with fairly rare, uh, fi- I want to say fiberglass cars, but the car, three cars I picked, I don't think I was able to verify all three were indeed fiberglass, but they're they're basically the same vein spirit of Devon. So are you ready to go? I am ready. All right, so your first car is a 1965 Apollo 5000 GT. So that is a fiberglass car. They had the 3500, which had the 3.5 liter, but this is the 5 liter Buick V8. Uh, Let's see, the next car is a 1965 Cheetah GT with that Corvette engine in it. Actually, that might be, uh, I might be making this too easy on you. All right, and then the third car, a lot of (laughs) folks don't know about this one. We'll see if you do. It's a 1967 De Tomaso Vallalunga with a rear engine 1.5 liter Kent engine. So those are your, actually let me change up the Cheetah. That well, I don't know. Let me keep uh, it the way. I want the Cheetah in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but so the, the three the, cars the last one are the <laughs> six yeah, the three cars are the 65 Apollo 5000 GT, the 65 Cheetah GT and then the 67 Vallalunga. Which one would you keep forever? Which one would you cash in and then which one would you send to the crusher? I would keep the Apollo. That that was a beautiful car and actually um, fits almost in the John Durham do, and it was really built well. Um, I would send, I would go right to the cheater, to the crusher. I would save some lives. Oh my gosh. Those were, <laughs> those were crazy cars to drive. And, uh, um, honestly, when you have to connect the engine right to the rear differential, that, that was, uh, that was a scary car. And then you're sitting on the, the differential basically. Yeah. <laughs> slightly behind much. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. So that means you're going to cash in the Vallalunga, correct? Yeah. Yeah. All right. You surprised me on that. I thought you would cash in the Cheetah. I thought that was too easy. So I'm glad to hear you crush the Cheetah, of which there's only like 23 of them ever made. So that's a bold move, sir. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wasn't totally impressed by the Cheetah. Handful to drive. (laughs) Well, awesome, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us on the Collector Car Podcast. Good luck with everything and uh, looking forward to listening to it. Bye now. Well, there you have it. That was my interview with Kevin. Now, the new Devons are coming back and they can be customized to your taste, which is pretty cool. Now, if you would like one in your own garage, just tap the link in the description to learn more. Now it's time to talk about the differences between recreations, continuations, and replicars. So first, let's define what we are talking about today. Now, I must warn you, this is a lot to talk about. Now, there are five accepted terms for these cars. 
in general. And the first is the replicar. So let's talk about replicars first. A replica is a car that is made by a third party and not the original manufacturer. These are cars that are complete, ready to drive, and look a lot like the original cars that they were built to replicate. They probably have many upgrades and options that were not originally available in period. So when you think of a replica car, I most immediately go towards Cobras. Uh, Super Performance makes replica cars. There's a lot of different manufacturers out there, and Backdraft as well. And I'll use the Backdraft example. So Backdraft's Cobra can be optioned with a new 5-liter Coyote engine, a V8 engine, a 10-speed automatic transmission with paddle shifters, carbon fiber dash, and heated seats. Now, none of these options were available on the original Cobra. A V8 was, but it wasn't a 5-liter fuel-injected Coyote engine. So they had none of these options. Now, if you wanted to warm up in an AC Cobra, you had to huddle near the exhaust side pipes. The next group of cars we'll talk about are kit cars. Now, this is from MotorBiscuit.com. Kit cars are component vehicles. Some kits contain all the components necessary to complete the car, except fluids. Other time, the kit from the manufacturer will require a donor vehicle. Manufacturers will make it clear to the purchaser ahead of time if a donor vehicle will be necessary. You can go back to the original Myers Manx Doom Buggies, which those were kits that were meant to go on top of your VW Bug chassis. Even to today's Factory 5 AC Cobras that are kit cars or can be bought as a kit. Now, there are also turnkey kits that have already been put together by an authorized builder. So typically, those are worth more. They obviously cost more because they come to you complete. And depending on the quality and the reputation of the authorized builder, that can add value. Now, for an example of some of the costs for Factory 5, their cost of a kit for an AC Cobra start around $20,000, which probably does not include the engine, to almost $300,000 for an Auburn Boattail Speedster kit. Now for kit cars, the build quality varies tremendously, as you can imagine, because it could be some guy in his garage, to it could be an authorized builder. So be careful if you're looking at buying a kit car made by someone else. All right, the next group of cars we'll talk about are clone cars. Now, from drivingline.com, clones are vehicles that are built from humbler sedans, coupe convertibles, and roadsters to resemble and drive like rare or more desirable models. So you can think of your LS6 Chevelles, your Pontiac GTOs, your Hemi Mopars. All of these cars may have been built on a six-cylinder base model, but was built up to look like the rare and expensive ones. Now, this also goes for Shelby's, GT350s, GT500s that maybe started as Mustang Fastbacks. Now, the one I want to kind of concentrate on are Mustang GTs because that's in my wheelhouse. You know, it's one thing if someone's a 1965 Mustang GT convertible as a clone. They're upfront. They're honest about it. Take it for what it's worth. That car will be worth more than, say, you know, the six-cylinder convertible it was based on if it's done correctly. A lot of times the clones are not done 100%. They're kind of mishmashed or kind of thrown together to look good, to bring more money with very little investment. So I like looking at the 1965 GT Mustang. Some fun ways to tell if it's real. The GT package for the Mustang included many options that were not on the base car. So for example, for the GTs for 1965 and 1966, the base engine had to be a four barrel 289 V8. Now that could either be the A code which is the base 289 four barrel, or it could be the K code, which is the high performance version. It could not be the C code, which is the two barrel 289, and it could not be one of the six cylinder cars, which I think those were T code cars. So it has to be an A code or a K code. Now, 67 was a little bit different because you could also get it as a C code. That's a one off. Now, there was a lot of additional items for the GT. This included a dual exhaust throughout the rear valance, trumpet exhaust. It had rocker stripes on the side. It had disc brakes that were not powered assist. It had GT badging. The side ornamentation on the base car was deleted. Uh, the GT cars had fog lights. They had a, for 1965, they had a five gauge cluster for the instrument panel. And a couple other things that are harder to spot is the GTs had a quick ratio steering box and a thicker sway bar. Now, the easiest ways to tell if you're looking at a clone or not versus a real GT is if some of the things are off. So if it is the wrong code, if, if it is a C code that is built to look like a GT or a six-cylinder car, if the side ornamentation is still on the car, even though it has the 
rocker stripes and the other adornments if it doesn't have the dual exhaust but it does have the fog lights if it doesn't have the fog lights but it does have the dual exhaust uh, if it's a four-wheel lug that's a big red flag because that means it used to be a six-cylinder car now there are even better ways to test to see if it was if it is a real gt or not this is getting into the minutia so like when you turn the fog lights on on a real gt the brake lights should also call come on because they are part of the actual wiring harness. Because of the dual exhaust, there's exhaust hangers present under the rear seat that can be replicated, but it's harder to replicate. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, there's a buck tag. Not all the cars had buck tags, but if they did, it will have GT package on it. If you had the original window sticker, which is pretty rare for 65 and 66, the Marty report was only available 1967 and later. Now, the best ways to test if this is a real GT or if it's a clone, there's two that I've identified. One of them is uh, there's a punched hole on the radiator support for the fog light wiring. This should be punched from the factory, which is not possible to do outside of a large stamping metal stamping environment. Uh, you can usually tell if it's drilled or not. If it's drilled, it's a clone. It's not a real GT. And the best way is if you go underneath the car, look at the frame rear frame rail, there's actually crash guards for uh, the bolt-on dual exhaust, and it's pretty fun. You can actually go back there, stick your finger up this little hole, and point towards the front of the car. If you feel a metal plate, it's a real GT. If you don't feel the metal plate, it's not a factory GT. And that is just something no one would replicate because there's too much welding involved to make a fake GT. So all this means is you want to have an expert check out a car if it's being advertised as new and you might think it's a clone all right another one i won't mention too much here is resto mods i won't go into those because they're not continuation cars they're not replica cars basically that's taking the vin stripping a car down to its chassis and making it up to modern standards so let's look at a 1963 corvette they'll build it up with the ls engine with the new suspension the new drivetrain the new brakes the new everything ac power steering heated seats, power seats, so it's no longer factory correct. It's not a continuation car. It can be uh, licensed as a 1963 Corvette because it does have the VIN. Uh, typically, these trade in the two hundred fifty dollars to $350,000 range. Bear Jackson sells these all the time. Depending on the builder, they're, they're wonderful, incredible cars. Uh, I'm curious to see what the resale value will be on these cars in the future, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, but that is not something we're going to talk about much today. The one I will call out is if you go to my YouTube channel and look at the most recent video about classic Broncos in Columbus, Ohio, that's a very cool company that basically takes a Bronco chassis with the VIN, and that's it, and they build it up from there. It's all new body panels. It's leather interior. It's the Coyote 5.0 V8. Beautiful, incredible Broncos. And again, they start at, I think, one sixty-five for a carbureted car and they go over $300,000 for the full-on uh, sport ute. So really cool. Check that out. And that's all I'll talk about on Resto Mods. Now, finally, we're going to get to continuation cars. This is the big point of this conversation today. What are continuation cars? Now, from IntoTheMines.fr, a continuation car is an old car model recreated after the original manufacturer's official end of production it is not a replica, which is made by a third party, nor is it an actual example, meaning original from period. Continuation cars are, therefore, a particular type of car built, in according, built according to the original plans from period parts, sometimes decades after the original model has been discontinued. The very first continuation car built was the Aston Martin DB4 GT Zagato Sanction 2 in the late 1980s. Now, this is pretty fascinating. From Haggerty, the most desirable of the lot are so-called Sanction 2 cars. By the late 1980s, Aston's managers cast a greedy eye at the huge money being thrown at the company's most charismatic sports racers from the early 1960s. In particular, there was the DB4 GT Zagato, essentially the Ferrari 250 GTO of Aston Martins. With its perfect profile, double roof line, and deep dish wire wheels, demand from collectors far outstripped the meager supply of just 20 cars. And in the late 1980s, they were selling at auction for up to 1.7 million pounds, which is probably around $1.9 million. Ironically, when the DB4 GT Zagato was introduced originally, Aston could scarcely give the things away. 
poor timing meant front engine sports cars were becoming obsolete for serious racing. As a result, there was a group of four chassis numbers that had been assigned to cars that were never built. Thus, the DB4 GT Zagato Sanction 2 was born, basically taking and recreating those four. Not surprisingly, Aston had a hard time stopping there. About 10 years later, it authorized Zagato to finish two extra body shells as Sanction 3 cars. And just last year, which would have been a couple years ago, Aston Martin announced it would build 19 more now tagged continuation cars. This time you need to buy a DBS Zagato with it, a two-for-one deal that costs an eye-watering $7.4 million. Jaguar has adopted similar phrasing and similar justifications for its recreations, and I totally remember when this stuff happened. In 2014, the Jaguar Classic engineering team cut its teeth by building six continuation lightweight E-type coupes, the bespoke competition version of the E-type. Jaguar Classic next announced that it would sell nine copies of the continuation XKSS, exact duplicates of the originals, save for a safer and more modern fuel cell and a fuel system designed to tolerate modern petrol better. As Aston did with the Sanction 2 DB4 GT Zagato, Jaguar made the case that it was merely completing original production. Jaguar calls its lightweight E-types the missing six cars planned but never built in period. And it can point to the famous 1957 fire at the Dickensian Jaguar Works on Browns Lane in Coventry as prematurely ending production of the XKSS. This is pretty funny. Not every producer of continuation cars has relied on complicated pretense. The ever true Carroll Shelby, for instance, dispensed with the unused serial number nonsense. His credible case for bringing continuation Cobras into the world boiled down to the fact that A, he could, and B, he could make a fast buck doing it. And we'll get to the Cobras here in a second. It is quite messy. In contrast, you cannot legally drive most continuation cars on the road in many countries. They simply can't be made to pass modern safety and emission laws, and companies like Jaguar or Aston Martin don't qualify for any sort of small manufacturer loophole. The lightweight E-Type, XKSS, and DB4 GT Zagatos are thus sold for off-road or show and display use only. Now, I had no idea about that. I find that actually shocking, and I would think that would impact the recent sales of these continuation cars even more, uh, but we'll have to see as these come up to market. Now, continuation Cobras skirt this issue since they are supplied as a rolling project. Engines must be fitted by customers or dealers, so they're road legal in most places in much the same manner as a kit car. To add insult to injury, continuation cars usually don't qualify for the best vintage racing events either. Given this major catch, you'd think continuation cars would trade in a very thin market at a discount from the original price. Yet that doesn't seem to be the case. There are limited sales from which to draw definitive conclusions, but the market for them seems surprisingly bullish. For instance, a Sanction 2 DB4 Zagato sold at Bonham's auction in 2012 for about $1.9 million. This is no challenge to an original which Haggerty values around $10 million, but a DB4 Zagato of any providence comes to market so rarely that someone who has waited for years or even decades for one might jump at the opportunity, opportunity to buy a Sanction 2 or Sanction 3 version. All right, here's another view on continuation cars from highconsumption.com. Continuation cars occupy an interesting niche which, within the auto industry because they're both more authentic than a replica and also less so than a card-carrying classic. Effectively real and yet at the same time not real, as you'd expect, their value falls somewhere between the two, meaning that even though they won't fetch the same exorbitant sums as an original, they're still capable of commanding a pretty hefty price tag. For instance, Jaguar E-Type lightweight continuation car costs $1.6 million from the factory, and the first production example sold for $1.7 million at RM Sotheby's auction in October 2020. Now, that was our Elkhart sale. That was an outlier. That thing was freaking nuts. I mean, people were paying above retail for used car lifts. It was really nuts. And that was like first time people got out from COVID. You got to take that with a grain of salt. All right. Uh, they go forward by saying that's undoubtedly a lot of money, but it's still far more affordable than the nearly $11.5 million you pay for the actual thing. As such, in many ways, continuation cars are collectibles unto their own. That being said, the segment is still evolving. So only time will tell how these cars will impact the classics market upon their initial conception Continuation proved to be quite a controversial topic, 
with, with collectors everywhere decrying automakers for selling out in order to make a quick buck. And that's not all. Given their limited road legality, continuation cars have often been discounted as abominations, serving as little more than a trophy attesting to the performance of the real thing. Regardless of where you stand on the ethics of bringing classics back into production, the chance that they'll have any impact on the originals is highly unlikely. If anything, they serve as a stand-in for those once-in-a-million cars that hardly ever come up for auction. I kind of agree with that. I mean, some folks will say, well, look at AC Cobras. What would AC Cobras be worth, the real ones, if there were never any replicas? I would imagine they would be worth more, but I don't think it affected it horribly. And the flip side of that is, is I actually know a big-time collector that refuses to buy an AC Cobra, even though he has a ton of Shelbys, because he thinks people won't know it's not a replica. And I'm like, that, that shouldn't stop you from buying it. All right, so in my mind, the value hierarchy is from the most valuable to the least valuable. Obviously, the original cars are the most valuable, then the continuation cars, then the replica, then the kit and or clone, depending on what the clone is based on. Uh, that, you know, that could affect whether the kit's worth more or the clone's worth more. All right, now, like I said, Cobras are their own hot mess to figure out from evaluation standpoint. I'm going to give it my best shot here. So there are the real ones, there are continuation cars, there are replica cars, there are kit cars, and there's even a flu few clones out there, believe it or not. I will try and give you an overview of ranking by value. Like I said before, the AC Cobra is the most replicated car in history, and I learned a lot when I was trying to figure this whole thing out. All right, from the Cobra Authority, for all of its fame, the original Cobra was produced in surprisingly low quantities. Just 998 were assembled from 1961 until 1968. These numbers include street cars, competition cars, semi-competition roadsters, etc. All real Cobras have a CSX number starting with either 2,000 for the small block cars or 3,000 for the big block cars. And the very first Cobra ever was CSX 2000. Ironically, there is a 1000 series of Cobras. This is where it gets kind of confusing. This was a money grab by Carroll Shelby. So this must have been in the early 2000s. Carroll Shelby wanted to offer the highest quality continue, continuation Cobra available. Each 1000 series car would be finished in-house at Shelby's Las Vegas facility. And all, of, all CSX 1000 cars received bodies painstakingly hand-formed in aluminum and sourced from England like the original Cobras. Now, I'm just going to go in numerical order here. So the next one are the 2000 series cars. Like I said, these are the real small block Cobras from the 60s. So CSX 2000 through CSX 2602, uh, those were Series 1, Series 2 cars. They started off with a 260 cubic inch engine, which became a 289 cubic inch engine. And then the Series 2 cars... Uh, had rack and pinion steering, uh, which was the big difference for those. Now, the 3000 series, those are the big block Cobras, the real ones from the 60s. CSX 3001 to 3100 were the competition models. Uh, let's see, Cobra Mark III production began on January 1st, 1965. Only 56 of the 100 planned cars were produced. Of those, 31 unsold competition models were detuned and fitted with windscreens for street use, called SC for semi-competition, and those are extremely valuable. We're talking three, four, five million dollars. All right, the CSX 3101 to 3360 were the production models. Uh, some Cobra 427s were actually fitted with Ford's 428 cubic inch engine, a longer stroke, smaller bore, lower cost engine intended for road use rather than racing. All right, so those were the real ones, the 2000s and the 3000s. All right, let's go to the 4000 series. The initial version of the continuation cars, and they all had they were all 427 SC semi-competition models fitted with modern amenities, aluminum or fiberglass bodies with 427 or 428 engines. And then you went to your 6000 series. So this was the follow-up to the 4000 series, but featuring coil-over suspension. As far as I could tell, that was the only difference between the 4000 series and the 6000 series. I have yet to find out why there's not a 5000 series. <laughs> All right, then we go to the 7000 series. Now, this was the 289 FIA Leaf Spring Race Version continuation car. 
and then we go to the 8000 series. Now this is the original slab side <clears throat> leaf spring streetcar and it was limited to 50 examples. That's probably my favorite. It's the slab side small block 289. All right, so how would you value these Cobras? Now I have 12 listings here. So let's go from the most valuable to the least valuable. So the most value would be the, the 3000 series original cars, the big block cars that sell typically between $3 million and $6 million. The 2000 series would be second. Those are the original small block cars. Those have been selling around $950,000 all the way up to $4 million for a recent factory race uh, 289 car. Number three would be a, the aluminum big block continuation cars. Actually, there's like three of these I put in the same bucket. They're all around two fifty to four hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's the aluminum big block continuation cars. So that would be the four thousand or six thousand series cars. I also put in AC Ace or AC Bristle clones. So these would be where someone took the original AC Ace and original Bristol and turned it into an AC Cobra because as the original car, they're worth around $350,000, $450,000. So why would you change them into an AC Cobra? But 10, 20 years ago, they weren't worth as much, and people did that. And I actually know Reggie Jackson has one of these cars. All right, so number five, I would put the Sanction 2 Cobras, again, in that 250 to 450 range. Uh, this is little known, but in 2014, the Carroll Shelby Trust elected to complete this unfinished run using the remaining 427 SC chassis numbers. So these are actually 3,000 numbered cars to avoid federal and state safety issues as well as EPA requirements for new model year vehicles. These Sanction 2 Cobras were not offered for street use. They are pure race cars built to the GT class specs necessary for Shelby American to compete for the 1966 FIA World Championship. So that's why these are depressed somewhat. So they're big block aluminum bodied continuation cars with serial number 3000, but they're not street legal. So that kind of offsets the rarity of that. All right, number six, I put aluminum small block continuation cars. Those are typically 150 to $250,000. Number seven, I put fiberglass big block continuation cars. So this could be a 4000 series car, but it's a fiberglass car. Number eight, I put aluminum big block replicars. This would be from the likes of Kirkham or Autocraft. Number nine, I put fiberglass small block continuation cars. So now we're around the $100,000 mark, maybe a little bit less. Number 10, I put Austin Healey Cobra clones because that was a thing that was done for a while. So as an Austin Healey, it's probably worth at least you know, 40 grand, you know, considering it has a Cobra body on it. Uh, number 11, I put fiberglass replicas, and the number 12, I put the least valuable would be the fiberglass kit cars around 30 grand. That obviously that depends, you know, if it has a 427 or if it has a 351 or it has a 302, all of that puts into the equation. But the most valuable would be the 3000 series original big block. The least valuable would be the kit cars. So now what are some other continuation cars? Now this is kind of another deep dive. And this is from a great article on highconsumption.com. Now, based on the definition that a continuation car is built by its original manufacturer, many of the cars on this continuation, quote unquote, list are actually replicas as they are built by a third party. All right, the first one is the Alvis Sports Coupe. Alvis technically died off in 1967, but it left behind a factory chock full of enough parts and blueprints that Red Triangle could relaunch the brand in 2010. So because it was being built by Red Triangle, the Triangle, this is a replica car, not a continuation car. The Alvis Car Company are manufacturing to special order a limited number of famous Alvis models. They are faithful to the original design, and by using our works drawings from the period, they retain all their traditional character and quality, yet are emission compliant. That's pretty amazing, actually. All right, the next one is the Aston Martin DB5 Goldfinger. So here we are taking James Bond, James Bond's DB5 and making it, you know, the iconic one with all the gadgets. Out of all the famous movie cars, there are a few that boast quite the same renown as 007's 1964 Aston Martin DB5. This Goldfinger special continuation car takes the magic of the silver screen and translate it into real life. As such, each of the 25 cars built at AM's Newport works facility will come with many of the hidden gadgets that you'll find on Q's creation itself, such as a pair of replica Browning machine guns, a rotating license plate, and even some tire slashers. 
Sorry, no working ejector seat, but there is a red button. All right, the next one is the Bentley blower. When Bentley debuted the blower back in 1929, it went from being an otherwise unknown automaker to being a serious industry contender. In celebration of the legendary race car, the British brand will be producing 12 exact recreations, each one using 3D scanning, more than 40,000 hours of expert labor, and 2,000 different specially designed parts. Powered by a 4.4 liter inline four, it's good for speeds up to 140 miles per hour. Not bad for a car that's coming up on almost 100 years now. So if you do the math, 40,000 hours at $100 an hour, that's a $4 million car. All right, next one's a Caterham 7310. Colin Chapman first designed the 7 in 1957 as an effort to create a do-it-yourself two-seat sports car for the masses. After acquiring the rights to build the platform in 1973, Caterham has since expanded the lineup to include five different vehicles with everything from a 135 horsepower 270 model all the way up to a supercharged 310 horsepower 620 model. 135 horsepower might not sound like much, but consider this. The 7 weighs just under 1,200 pounds. All right, next is the classic recreations Shelby Mustang GT500 CR. While this particular Mustang skews a bit more towards the rest of mod than it does continuation car, it's officially licensed by Shelby American. It comes with a signature stamp of Carroll Shelby, and it even earns a spot on the Shelby registry. Suffice to say, it's legit. Shod in a slew of carbon fiber, it comes in more than 600 pounds lighter than the original. And that's not all. Under the hood, it has been treated to a fuel-injected 7-liter Ford V8 good for 545 horsepower. I love these recreations. Uh, There's another place in Florida that does them. They're absolutely gorgeous. It's a car that if I owned, I would drive the wheels off of it. It would probably be my daily driver, but I'm not going to spend 200 grand for a daily driver. All right, next is the DeLorean DMC-12. DMC may have folded after just two years of production, but the brand was revived when the unrelated Texas-based DeLorean Motor Company acquired the automaker's name and spare parts in 1997. At present, the outfit only offers parts support for some 6,500 cars still on the road today. However, once the Low Volume Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Act was signed into law in 2015, the new DeLorean announced that it would be able to resume production. We're still waiting, so you may need to look into a flux capacitor and tell us if it ever comes to fruition. Not sure that's going to happen because when I went to the website, it already had a redirect to another website. It was kind of defunct. All right, next is the GTO Engineering 250 short wheelbase revival. This is a Ferrari. Under normal circumstances, an authentic Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase would cost you somewhere in the range of $8 million to $10 million. However, thanks to GTO Engineering's 250 SWB Revival Project, you can have one for about a tenth of that figure. The product of over 200 years worth of combined Ferrari mechanic expertise, it uses the actual blueprints from a 250 GT short wheelbase in order to be a damn near perfect replica. In addition to a 280 horsepower Columbia V12, GTO Engineering has also fitted it with a newly design tubular frame as well as some improved suspension and steering so this is definitely a replica car now the they mentioned one-tenth the price you're talking 800 grand on the low end they did advertise a 1962 ferrari 250 pontoon fender testarossa recreation uh, that sold for around eight hundred thousand dollars recently that they also built and that was gorgeous all right next is the jaguar c-type Based on Jaguar's first-ever Le Mans-winning racer, this C-Type recreation is the latest installment in the British automaker's crop of continuation cars. It's built to the same exact specifications as the 1953 model year with a 220-horsepower, 3.4-liter, straight-liter 6, a handcrafted tubular frame and aluminum body, as well as some powerful disc brakes of the period. But the best part is that each example is made to order allowing customers to choose everything from the paint and livery to the badging and interior trim. I would hope so for that price. All right, we've got a few more here. The next one's Land Rover Defender Series 1. I had no idea this was happening. If you're after a factory-fresh, first-gen Defender, you're in luck. Back in 2016, Land Rover launched its Reborn project in an effort to restore 25 Series 1s back to their former glory. Crafted using the same parts and specifications as they were when new, each one is built out of the original Defender Production Center. With their purchase, the customers can have a choice of their preferred base platform, 
Five period correct paint colors as well as interior finishing and trim. What's more, they even get to follow their truck's restoration from start to finish. So that's an original car that's just being restored, not a continuation, not a replica. All right, the next one is the Persang Bugatti Type 35. Persang is an Argentinian-based automotive outlet that specializes in the recreation of vintage Alfa Romeos and Bugattis. And before you discount this as some overpriced kit car, consider this. Only 40 Type 35s were originally produced, and a significant number of them were raced into the ground, making those left on the road few and far between. While this example may be a completely in-house build, it's been reversed from Bugatti's blueprints, meaning that it sports the same stunning visuals and thrilling performance as the real thing. So this is a replica car, not a continuation car. If you go to Jay Leno's channel, uh, he, he does a deep dive on one of these per sayings. It is unbelievable. And, and uh, Wayne Carini recently bought one. They cost about three hundred fifty grand. They are super cool. And if you go to uh, my YouTube channel, if you go back to, I guess, uh, Amelia Island, I did get a video of uh, Wayne taking off in his purse saying, I would love to have one of these. I mean, they're super tight. you got to love the person you're sitting next to because you're basically on top of each other. But everything about it is special and amazing. All right, the last one I'll talk about is the Super Performance GT40. Given that Ford produced only a little over 100 examples of the GT40 during its 1964 to 1969 assembly run, the platform has since become a seven-figure collector's dream. Never fret, for Super Performance's continuation comes, comes at a much more reasonable $125,000. And because over two-thirds of the rolling chassis parts are interchangeable with those of the original car, it bears a Shelby stamp of approval and can even be enrolled in the official GT40 registry. However, it's worth noting that due to today's safety regulations, it comes as a roller, meaning you'll have to install the engine yourself. All right, so that's, again, a replica car, not a continuation car. And you can see that the lines are becoming blurred. I mean, if, you know, you can't drive the continuation cars that are made back to exact factory standards by the manufacturer, but you can drive a kit car you put together with little experience, in some cases, in your garage. So you can drive the one that you actually build yourself, but you can't drive the one that the experts build doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so it's interesting to learn more about these. I'm a little, before I was all for continuation cars because I thought, you know what, get it at a lower price point where more people are going to enjoy it. But if you can't actually enjoy it, it's kind of what's the point. So I want to do some more research to make sure that is true, that you can't drive these continuation cars. So how do we classify a recreated Devon? So I would definitely call it a replica car based on our conversation. And I would also say it's very cool. I think I need to click the link in the description and put one in my own garage. And I will talk to all of you next week where we have a special guest. We have Joe Bortz who owns a collection of some of the rarest prototypes from the 1950s and 1960s in the world. And he's selling two of them through RM Sotheby's May Online Sale. Really cool stuff. Be sure to listen in next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast. <laughs>